So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and invade this place, invade our church, invade our hearts and our minds, invade our lives, and reveal yourself to us in these moments. In your name we pray. Amen. So I have this sort of comical picture in my mind when it comes to this story, it comes to the ascension. I, I picture Jesus and his disciples standing there on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus has just explained to them that, that power will come upon them when the Holy Spirit comes, and, um, and then they will have the power to be Jesus' witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even into the ends of the earth. And then the very next moment, he's gone. It's like, poof, he just disappears up into the clouds, up into heaven. And I have this picture in my mind of the disciples. In the NIV, it says they were standing there staring intently towards heaven. And I have this picture of them just kind of standing there staring at the clouds, much the same way that my dog, Zanzibar, stares at the front door when we all leave. You know what I'm talking about with those big, sad puppy dog eyes, her head kind of cocked to the side? Just kind of wondering when it is that we're going to come back. And I picture the disciples sort of staring up these clouds, head cocked, all kind of the same direction, saying, you don't think he really just left for good, do you? I mean, he is, he's coming back. He's got to come back. He's not possibly leaving this up to us, is he? And I picture the exact same thing happening on the other side of the aisle or up in heaven when Jesus arrives and everybody's celebrating and cheering and God and St. Peter and all of the heavenly hosts are there and they're all thanking Jesus and congratulating him when God says, so what is your plan, Jesus, to sort of spread this gospel, this message that you brought down there? What, what are you going to do? How are you going to take care of that? And Jesus sort of points down to these, at that point, 11 disciples who are standing there with their heads up, their mouths gaping open, their heads cocked to the side, staring at the clouds, and uh, Jesus goes, oh, them. Suddenly God says, wait a second, Jesus, we've been watching you. We know these guys. They are not all that reliable. They're not that trustworthy. Jesus, do you think they're even capable of spreading the message around the world? Jesus, you must have a backup plan at the very least. I mean, this is sweet and nice and very empowering of you, but what happens when these guys mess it up? You must have a plan B. What is your plan B? And Jesus looks at him and says, they are my plan B. It's just them. And like my dog, I've always wondered when we leave Zanzibar there staring at the door, how long does she stand there before she finally goes and does something else? And I wonder about the disciples also, how long did they stand there before they finally got back? It says they went back to the upper room and they devoted themselves to prayer and got about the business of replacing Judas. Remember, Judas was no longer there. And they had two candidates. Do you remember this? Barsabbas and Matthias. And so they decide they're going to shoot craps for it. It's kind of an odd thing. It says they cast lots. They're like, Mama needs a new pair of shoes! <laughs> and the lot falls to Matthias, and so he's the next disciple. And we never hear anything about him again. But then immediately after that comes the day of Pentecost with this mighty rushing of wind and the and the descending of the tongues of flames, and everybody speaking in all of the different languages, and, 
and, and the descending of the Holy Spirit. And then finally they get it. And they understand. No longer are they looking up at the clouds, but looking out towards the rest of the world. Suddenly they have a mission in life. They have a purpose. And they have a power. A power to do the exact thing that Jesus commanded them to do, to go out and to become his witnesses out in the world. And at that very moment, those disciples, those students, went from being disciples to being apostles, or sent ones. Now, I think we have to be really clear about something right from the start. A, a witness is not expected to convince anyone of anything or to make anything happen on their own. In a courtroom, a, a courtroom judge would be very unhappy if a witness decided to get creative, right? The witness is expected just to see something and then to come and describe what they saw and what they experienced. We are not asked, the apostles were not asked to make anything happen, to do anything, to change anything, to convince anyone of anything, to save themselves, let alone save anyone else. They were just asked to be God's witness. Which I think is a really good point when it comes to a day like today, like Pentecost Day. Because ever since that first Pentecost, we have been pretty pathetic about trying to explain the Holy Spirit, haven't we? I mean, we do not do a very good job at saying who he or she or it is, what it is, how it works, how we call upon this power. We, we have so little idea or how this Holy Spirit fits into this thing we call the Trinity with God and with Jesus. We have no idea. St. Patrick tried to use this example of a three-leaf clover. Do you remember that? I mean, how lame was that? And then in the first council of Nicaea, they, they had this idea of that the three of them are homo ousios, which meant one substance. Some people were saying, oh, it's kind of like ice and water and, and, and steam. It, it, it all is sort of the same substance, but different manifestations. What are you talking about? We Presbyterians have been the worst of all. I remember one time I was trying to put together a sermon for on the Holy Spirit up in Westlake where I was working, and I was out with my young adults at Lamp Post Pizza, and I was saying, guys, I, I have to do this sermon on the Holy Spirit, and I'm really struggling here. What can you tell me to help me as I prepare for this sermon? And nobody said anything. Not one word. Finally, Rob Douglas. Do you remember Rob Douglas? He used to be the youth director here. He finally piped up. He said, good luck. <laughs> Alistair McGrath, who is a professor at the University of Oxford, um, said that when he was a child, he was in church, and one time they were reciting the Athanasian Creed, and they got to that part that said, the Father incomprehensible, Jesus incomprehensible, the Holy Spirit incomprehensible. And this man leaned over to his wife in a voice loud enough that everybody heard said, the whole damn thing incomprehensible. <laughs> but you know, for centuries we've been arguing and debating and holding councils and issuing decrees to try to figure out what this means. They finally found out, figured out that the most orthodox way to talk about the Holy Spirit was not to say anything at all. To just basically call it a mystery. Talk about a cop-out, right? And as a result, the Holy Spirit's become sort of a mystery to all of us. Isn't that right? Which is why I think that Jesus' advice to the disciples as they were becoming apostles is really an important point for us to consider today. That we were never asked to explain the Holy Spirit, to figure the Holy Spirit out, to tell people how the Holy Spirit works or what the Holy Spirit does or exactly how you call upon the Holy Spirit's power. We've been asked to be witnesses, to witness to what our experience is with the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives, how we have seen the Holy Spirit at work in our world and in other people's lives. Isn't that what we do every Pentecost Sunday once a year when we come into this place? We just recite the stories. We retell the stories that, 
those first Christians had of their experience, what they saw, what they felt, what they experienced with the Holy Spirit. And so I thought today maybe I would just tell you a little bit about my own experience with the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know a lot about the Holy Spirit or how it works, but I do know that in my life I've felt two major themes coming to me through the Holy Spirit. The first is an incredibly strong sense of inner peace. And the second is an outward power. Inner peace and outward power. You know, it makes sense. Jesus kind of promises both of those things, doesn't he? The passage we just read from Acts. He said, power will come upon you. when the, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then in the Gospel of John, they read it earlier. He says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And now peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. and Do not let them be afraid. For me, the Spirit brings this inner peace that no matter what I do, no matter how badly I blow it, no matter how often I make the same mistakes, that I'm going to be forgiven over and over again, given a fresh start, a new beginning, every single day that the slate is going to be clean. I believe, I, up here, I understand that God has forgiven me. I read it in the scriptures, but it's the Spirit that makes me really believe that deep down in my heart, to really feel it, for it to affect who I am, for it to help me get out of the bed every single morning, to accept that clean slate, to accept that forgiveness. I know that the Spirit sees inside of me, sees me in a way that I don't even understand or see myself. Knows every flaw, every failure, every spit of hypocrisy inside of me, all of my fears and my insecurities and my issues and baggage and hang up and loves me and accepts me exactly for who I am anyway. I love reading what Jesus says about forgiveness and fresh starts. And I love hearing the stories. I love hearing the decrees in the Bible. But it's the Holy Spirit who makes me actually believe day by day that I have been cleansed and made whiter than snow. It's also a sense of inner peace that I will never, ever be alone again. That no matter what I go through in this life, no matter what failures I go through, mistakes I make, difficult situations I end up in, wherever I am, whatever it is, wherever I go, I will never be alone. Because God's Spirit goes with me everywhere on this trip we're about to take. I could fall down into some mild, deep crevice on some glacier in Iceland and wiggle away until I die down there, but I would still not be alone. I could get eaten by a pack of hyenas in Kruger National Park. So don't think about any of this stuff. That. But even then, I would never be alone. I've told you this story before, but I met a man from Rwanda, who a Tutsi who had survived the genocide at the Rwandan war atrocity trials. He was there as a witness for one of the trials. And he had managed to survive the genocide by lying absolutely still and present, pretending that he was dead under the cold, lifeless bodies of his wife and two children for 36 hours. And yet by the time he came to this trial, he was full of life and full of inspiration and praising God. And I, I didn't understand how this possibly could be. And he said, well, it, it's, it's hard for me to explain, but I realized when I was in that situation that no matter what else was taken away from me, everything, the most important things in my life could be taken away one by one. I could lose everything that I hold dear. The worst fears of my imagination could come true, and it could be as bad as it gets. And yet the one thing I will never lose is God's Spirit with me. I 
felt the Spirit every minute of those 36 hours under my family. And I've felt, I've felt the Spirit's presence in my life every day since then, telling me that there are still more things that God wants me to do before it's time for me to be reunited with my family. I know that there have been times in my life where I've needed to feel that kind of presence, and I have, and I know, I know so many of you who have felt it in your lives as well. The Holy Spirit means we will never, ever be alone. And that even when nothing is okay, somehow, deep down, it's all okay. And that sort of inner peace, it unlocks the most incredible outward power. We talk about Pentecost Sunday as the birthday of the church, but it was not the birthday of some new institution. It was never meant to be the birthday of some new religion. This was the birth of a new kind of power, a power that would go with us and give us a mission in life and a purpose in life that would allow us to become the witnesses for God to all of the places that we go and that we live. This is the meaning behind Paul in Romans, Romans 9, 18, when he says, creation waits longingly to see what the children of God will reveal. When Jesus says, you will do even greater works than I, it is because Jesus knows he's going to send the Spirit who will empower us, who will give us a very real, a very tangible power to be able to fulfill that mission, to be able to be those witnesses. And once again, I need to be really clear that we're not expected to change anyone or convince anyone or to make anything happen or to save ourselves, let alone others. We're just expected to partner with God. I know that we come here Sunday after Sunday and we kind of stare up at the clouds with our heads kind of cocked, up, just like my dog looking, saying, Jesus, seriously, you're expecting this from me? I can barely fix my own life, let alone fix the ends of the earth. And all God has ever asked us to do is with the Holy Spirit's help is to go and to allow ourselves to be used. To leave our upper rooms and to go out trusting that God will give us the words. God will help us know what to say. That God will help us to discover a thousand small and beautiful ways to share the love and the peace and the acceptance and the hope and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ with the world around us. To go out into our Jerusalems and our Judeas and our Samarias to our LAXs and the terminal where that refugee family came into not knowing what we're going to say or how we're going to act or what that's going to look like, but just offering ourselves and then allowing God to use that, to use us, however God sees fit. Not to take the place of what Jesus is supposed to do or what God's supposed to do, but to play our part. Look, I don't understand a lot about the Holy Spirit. I just need to be totally straight with you. I don't understand who he is or how he or she or it works or what it looks like or how to activate it. All I know is what I've experienced. This incredible kind of inner peace. And this most amazing outward power that I have seen coming to play in my life over and over and over again that I would never, ever want to live without. 